Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So, we have at least three languages that I know spoken here today. And so, I want this to be a bit of a party. So, every time, every time, you see this. Every time you see this. I want you to just make so much noise and scream. Narcissistic products suck. When it blinks, now do it. Narcissistic products suck. Narcissistic products suck. Okay. Now, if you speak Spanish, okay. Someone else be in charge. Lead it. Narc. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> My very, very special friends from Globo out there. Hold on. It's coming. It's coming. I'm... Oh! <laughs> Portuguese. Mm, I know what the M stands for. <laughs> okay. So, uh, hello, Portuguese. <laughs> Okay, so this is what we're here to talk about today. Are you ready for this? All right, so during this talk, when I say products, I'm talking about digital products, apps, devices, appliances, a broad range of things that are connected. So that's the rule. If I say product, I mean a product that's connected. I totally acknowledge that a fork that I ate my breakfast with is also a product, but it's not connected to the internet, so I'm not talking about forks in this talk. All right, so I want you to meet Steve. We're going to need the volume up for Steve. Do you guys want to meet Steve? Yeah. All right, so Steve has a story to tell you. He rented a bitchin' Camaro. Do you guys know what a bitchin' Camaro is? Do you know what a Camaro is? Yeah, okay. So let's listen. Listen carefully to Steve's story. So last summer I had to rent a car for a business trip and they put me in this kind of brand new black Camaro Z1, which I thought was cool. And when I turned the car and started driving, um, this uh, heads up display appeared on the, uh, the windshield. So it projects the speedometer um, reading there. It looks like, kind of like a hologram. So very cool. So I'm feeling good in my, in my rental car here. Um, I turn on the satellite radio, it's playing some music, all of a sudden an ad comes on for supercuts, not unusual. But what, uh, what was unusual is the speedometer display on the windshield all of a sudden shrinks down a little bit and, the, and this ticker tape kind of scrolling display shows up underneath it and it starts reading 1-800 supercuts. And I wasn't stopped, I was driving and uh, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, this is a whole new low in, in advertising interruption. For anybody in the audience that did not understand Steve, because I'll acknowledge he does mumble a little bit, um, he was driving a car and it had a heads up display on the windshield and the satellite radio had an advertisement for a hair cutting place that came on and his speedometer shrunk down, the thing that he uses to tell how fast he's going got smaller so that a telephone number <laughs> while well, he's just cruising and driving his car this telephone number because you know number one advertising strategy for sure for sure I'm pretty sure a lot of people just like pull their car right over hell yeah I gotta get a haircut <laughs> right now and the funniest thing is, is Steve told me this story and he's bald. <laughs> uh, so the only, the only conclusion I can come to is that there was a group of people in a room somewhere going, how can we leverage the captive audience, right? There's, there's somebody thinking, you know, this guy's driving a car and he's not going anywhere. What can we sell to him? 
right? This has been happening on radio forever. This happens when you go to the bathroom sometimes, you know, at dance clubs, and they have a little message on the back of the door, and you're stuck there, and you have to read whatever they tell you. I'm not so sure about this strategy in this case, but let's see how it made Steve feel. How did it make me feel? Um, I, I guess I felt kind of duped. You know, it's like I, I'm in this, this futuristic car, um, bitchin' Camaro, got the speedometer projected in front of me like it's a hologram. Um, it's supposed to be there to, to make me safer, right? Um, it's not like I wrapped my car around the pole, but when the ad started showing up, it really was distracting. It made me think about this, and, um, you know, I got kind of mad. It seemed like it was doing the exact opposite of what it was supposed to do. In the conversation that I had with Steve, he said, I said, you know, what do you think about Chevrolet? What do you think about Camaro after driving that car? And he said, honestly, I don't trust them as much because they... They, they have this business arrangement behind the scenes between the creators of the heads-up display, Sirius Satellite Radio, the particular uh, whoever's advertising through the satellite radio, and they weren't considering him in the middle of any of those decisions, right? They weren't really thinking about the context. And I'm pretty sure that the people at Supercuts also weren't like, yeah, this is going to be an effective ad campaign. They probably don't even realize that this advertisement is playing across the windshield when people are driving. So... Bitching Camaro, bitching Camaro, now in all the papers. But no fun, the old bitching Camaro with no insurance to match. So if I, I have to that. run you down, please don't <laughs> leave a scratch. Okay, so... Narcissistic products suck. Narcissistic products suck. All right, so here's what I'm here to talk to you about today. We're going to talk about four things. I'm going to give you my definition of what a narcissistic product is. I'm going to share some more stories from people who have been dealing with the travesty of narcissistic products and give you a few, a few thoughts about why I think this problem exists. And then ultimately, I'm going to tell you what to do about it. Now, you are probably all out there going, well, I'm not designing these crappy things. I didn't do that. Why do I, what do I have to learn from this? So we can talk about that at the bar afterwards, but I, but I think there's going to be some, some hidden gems in here for everyone. All right, so let's start off with my definition of narcissistic product. They're similar to narcissistic people. This guy's amazing. So, the characteristics. They tend to have an exaggerated sense of self-importance. Lack empathy, kind of intrude on other people's conversations, expect others to go along with their ideas, and get very, very fussy, upset when people do not go along with those ideas. They're jealous of others and believe that others are jealous of them. Have you guys ever interacted with a product, a connected product that behaves this way? Raise your hand. There are three people in the room. Okay, this is going to be a tough argument. <laughs> All right. But we wouldn't intentionally hang out with this guy, right? Unless you're into... Are those dolphins? Dolphins. Unless you're into dolphins. And I kind of like what <laughs> what's happening with his hair. is pretty great, too. All right. But we interact with these products all the time. And... It goes way, way beyond social media. So a narcissistic product puts its own interests in front of the interests of the people that use it. This is my definition. These products typically demand attention from you that is disproportionate to the job that you hired them to do. So let's, let's dig into a few more stories. So let me start with what I did. For this talk, I did a tiny little bit of research. So I did some surveys, I did some interviews, I did a lot of observation, and I pulled four major themes, and I held up 10, so, but not 10. Let's try this again. Four, one, two, three, four. Four major themes. And the four major themes can be deduced to this. The attention carjacker, or the attention jacker, the codependent game, 
the sociopathic Zen master in the high maintenance kitchen. We already talked about the first one, which is the attention carjacker. Let's move on to the next, which is the codependent game. So I want you to meet Wyatt. Wyatt downloaded a game to play. A free game. <laughs> to pass a little time. <clears throat> this is getting personal. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so, it wasn't really his thing, though, and this is why. So the point was to build a colony, you know, to get a whole, uh, it was one of those games where you kind of start building a city kind of thing. So building a colony, to build an army, to plant and grow and store wheat, and to turn it into bread in order to then feed your army and grow your city and this whole thing. Have, you, have any of you played a game like this, that's similar to this? Okay. He thought, though, this is boring and slow, so he turned it off. And remember, he's sitting when he's playing this game, so, <laughs> so he turns it off. All right, so the next day in a meeting, let's look at what happens the next day in a meeting. So the next day in a meeting, his phone goes off. He thinks it's probably something important. Notification, your barracks are overflowing. You need to build more barracks. He turns it off. Notification, your army is hungry. You need to harvest wheat. And he's in this meeting. Just his phone is going off like crazy. And it's saying some silly stuff to him. And so he turns it off. How do you think that, I, that that experience made Wyatt feel? Because it seems pretty harmless. Well, let's listen. My barracks were full. My wheat thing was full. My people were starving. I felt obligated to take care of them, so I did. <laughs> That's amazing. It's amazing. OK. I let this go on for two days. Then I uninstalled it because it wouldn't let me play it when I wanted to. Oh, oh my God, I love this. So the thing is, Wyatt downloaded this game so that he could go to the bathroom, hang out with his phone for however long it takes him to go to the bathroom, and relax, get away from the day, not be bugged, not have to think about much. The game wasn't his thing. If the game would have left him alone when the game should have realized it wasn't his thing because he clearly turned it off multiple times, it would have been in service of the business that created that game. It would have been better for that company because Wyatt went from being like, this game isn't my thing, to now I'm standing on a stage in Buenos Aires and he's telling you how much he thinks this sucks. He's willing to have me interview him about how much he thinks this game sucks. And the point is, is that is not an effective approach or strategy for the business either. You don't want to annoy people to death to get them to pay for your product. So, they clearly had some misalignment between the people that are downloading their game and using it and how they actually want to use it. So these are clearly indicators of a narcissistic posture, a posture that is narcissistic from that product. That product thinks that it is inherently more important than Wyatt, and it's behaving that way. So, you guys are doing good. Okay, so we heard about the codependent game. Now let's look at the sociopathic, the, you know, we've talked a lot about sociopaths at this conference, it's interesting. The sociopathic Zen master. 
I move a lot, and I just hit the microphone repeatedly. Um, okay, so moving on, I want you to meet another person. This is Lee. Now, Lee is the director of strategy for Think. It's a firm in London. It's a digital strategy firm in London. And she has a lot of travel. She has a very stressful job. And she forgets to make time to kind of slow down. And so she decided, she's a friend of mine, and we were having a conversation about this, and she decided that she wanted to learn how to pause. She just wanted to learn how to stop. And so she tried out a few meditation apps. Has anyone in here ever tried out a meditation app? Okay, a few people. All right, well, let's, let's hear about her experience. So one of them just kept talking to me all the time. It would be, um, like continuously asking me if I wanted to be calm. So I'd be in the middle of a meeting and I would get a little, a little ping saying, oh, would you like a moment of calm? Uh, no, I would not like a bloody moment of bloody calm. I'm in a meeting. Um, and then it would just randomly send me all these like, messages about my stats telling me how often I'd meditated that week. I know, I know how many times I meditated. It was me, I was there. I was there when I meditated. <laughs> made Lee feel? Let's find out. I needed it to actually help me meditate, not to tell me when to bloody meditate. So she was feeling overwhelmed and stressed out by all of the things, all of the people, all of the meeting, all of the stuff in her work life. And she wants to learn how to meditate to calm that all, to calm it down. Right? And the meditation app that she chooses to download has the complete opposite effect. It's stressing her, I mean, clearly stressing her out. And it's bugging her. And what do you think the result is? What do you think ended up happening after this? Do you think she still uses this? This is not an effective business model. Having a narcissistic posture doesn't actually work for the long haul. It works for the short term. All right, so let's do this. Narcissistic products suck. Narcissistic products suck. All right, so let's move on to the final story. And this was a sad, sad tale. This is the high maintenance kitchen. The most common fear of all of the people I talked to, the most common fear that came up was the idea that their house was going to become high maintenance. That suddenly, the things around them were also going to start demanding their attention. And this came up conversation after conversation. And I thought, you know, people are terrified. They're terrified about this. So I saw this ad for a refrigerator that had Wi-Fi for recipes. But then it also connected to Twitter. I was terrified. The last thing I need is updates from my refrigerator. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? So let's take a look behind the scenes because I've worked on a lot of these projects and I've talked to a bunch of other designers that have worked on a lot of like connected home projects to talk about what kind of conversations are happening behind the curtain as the products are being designed. What is the environment like? So, everybody says this now. We want to be the nest of stoves, refrigerators, toilets. It doesn't really matter what, what, what they're talking about. They want to be the nest of it. Now, why is this? Okay, so we have to tease this apart a little bit. Because it's actually, while nest is great, there's always going to there's gonna be another nest next year, you know, whatever. There's always going to be a thing that companies go, that thing plus my product equals awesome. So what are they thinking when they talk about Nest? These were the conversations that I had behind the scenes. So it goes something like this. Somebody who has been working on a refrigerator, a refrigerator company, 
It's a guy who I'm talking to, and he's worked for this refrigerator company for like 20 years. What do you think he thinks about when he's at work? This is an easy one. Refrigerators. He like thinks a lot about refrigerators. He spends a great deal of time thinking about refrigerators. Okay, so he's thinking about refrigerators, and he's like, Nest. You know what they did? They created a smart thermostat. And you can sell it. They sell it for like $250 or something like that. And you know, it doesn't control the, it doesn't control the um, heating and cooling any better. This is literally the conversation we're having. It, it doesn't do a better job. So they made it smart and they can charge $250. So in his mind, here's the equation. You add sensors to whatever, anything. Refrigerator, put some sensors, you just throw them on there. And then you make it smart. And then you can put on the box all the things that the refrigerator or the thermostat or whatever does, and that makes it more valuable to the consumer. But the cool part is, is it doesn't have to do anything else differently. And I'm having this conversation, just kind of nodding my head, going, this is crazy. This is crazy. He believed this. And I'm thinking in my head, that is not at all what Nest did anyways, because it wasn't about like getting in a room and listing all the things that this technology could do. They thought about what it should do. And what it should do is freaking disappear, right? It should be something that you can entirely ignore. They had the confidence to have a brand that they allow recede in the background. And then they had the foresight to know at that moment in time that somebody happens to look over at the wall and check out their thermostat, it better be the most beautiful thing in the world. They did two things really, really well. Make it insanely beautiful from the out-of-box experience, every single interaction with this thing is like precise, yet it is meant for you to entirely ignore it. That is confidence. That is not narcissism. That is confidence. So, all right, so we're gonna make stuff smart. That's the new mandate, make it smart. Okay, well, what does that mean? Let me bring you behind the scenes again to some of these conversations. And I've got some notes because I actually just can't believe it. I had to write it down. Okay. So the conversation about the refrigerator, again, was they started discussing all of the data that you could get from your refrigerator. Yeah, it's so great. I'm, th I'm going to read a quote. Get it in the cloud. Imagine the analytics. Customers can get about the refrigerators. They could post to Facebook how many times the door opened today. <laughs> Can you imagine? I don't want to know what you ate for breakfast. If you tell me how many times your refrigerator door opened, I would just die. It's horrible. It's horrible. OK, so yeah, but it gets better. It gets better. They could look at the trends in door opening. Like, I want a couple of reports. <laughs> I want to see the chart, my door opening. And if someone happens to open it in the middle of the night, it can send you a notification. <laughs> You're like laying in bed, just sleeping. Your phone goes off. <laughs> Your phone goes off, and you, you pick it up, and it's letting you know that someone opened the refrigerator door. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. OK, so they're doing a lot of imagining or thinking about all the things that this could do and not enough about what it should do. This is how I imagine they see their customers, like literally just hanging out with their refrigerator. But nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to do that. I call that overestimating the give a fuck. Let's just round of applause for Lee. I call that overestimating the give a fuck. So all you need to take, and this is the only thing you need to learn from this talk. When you're in a meeting and there's a lot of 
overestimating the give a fuck going on, you just need to slow it down. You need to start asking questions that, that allow people in that meeting to understand how ridiculous these ideas are. Okay, you guys are getting better at this. I don't even have to do it anymore. Okay, so finally we got through the high maintenance kitchen. Moving on. So what I ask of you is to focus more on the service the product is intended to provide. The features will fall out of that. So think about this. A refrigerator is intended, like the service that it's here to provide is to keep your beer perfectly cold. Right? To maybe reduce your energy usage if you built, you know, you purchased a certain model. So I could see if you left the door open all day long, maybe it lets you know then, right? Or if you leave your stove on, the gas on, but I don't even want it to tell me. I just want it to turn it off. I want to never know that even happened, right? That, that would be smart. That would be very smart. Just because something is knowable does not mean that somebody actually needs to know it. Ask yourself, this thing, this social media strategy, the whatever it is that we're talking about, is this something that somebody actually needs to know? Or am I just deciding to put it out there because it is something that is knowable? Who gives a shit? And a sensor doesn't make, it doesn't make it smart. I think we should, let's clap for that. A sensor doesn't make it smart. Woo! <laughs> All right, so if they suck so bad, then why do narcissistic products exist? I have a few thoughts on this. Teams lose perspective. Remember the guy that I was telling you about that's been working with refrigerators for 20 years? Well, you guys do this too, we all do this. You work on a project and you go home and you're eating dinner and you're still talking about that project and then your husband or wife is like, I don't care. I don't, I, I don't care, stop talking about it. If you find that you're doing that, there's a good chance that your team is starting to develop a narcissistic posture. Because it means that you think that everybody eats, breathes, lives with, sleeps with your product. And they probably don't. It probably actually takes up about 30 seconds of their time four times throughout the day, you know? Maybe more, maybe more, depending. You could be developing software that helps them get their job done. And maybe then you get to think about being the center of their universe for like four whole hours or six hours. But the point is, is even then, it doesn't live in a vacuum. That product lives in an ecosystem with other products, and you want to think about that. Data. Data brings Big, big money. So I want, I want to think about this a little bit. The advertising industry in the United States is worth $30 billion. $30 billion. Yet, they're basing, they're hedging their bet on a commodity that is in limited supply. Your attention is a natural resource. It is in limited supply. You're going to run out of it. And so I want to challenge us to think about other ways of connecting with people. The technology around me is always begging for my attention. It's annoying. I have other things I want to do, but then I find myself paying attention to it anyway. It makes me feel powerless. And I always have the feeling like, oh, maybe this time it will be the important thing. But it never is. Our brains are changing, so I'm going to share, share a couple studies with you. So it, the University of Maryland did a study in 2012 with 1,000 students. And of that 1,000 students, a clear majority were unable to voluntary, voluntarily avoid using their gadgets, their cell phones, their whatnot, for an entire day. And when they required them to stop using their cell phones or gadgets, this is what happened they showed the same withdrawal symptoms as somebody who is addicted to a drug. They, had, they, had MR, they ran them through MRIs and their brains were very, very similar. 
For some of these people, the white matter in their brain is beginning to shrink. That's from a study from the Public Library of Science done in 2011. And why do you care about that? Because your white brain matter is what governs decision making. This is dangerous. Of 290 undergraduate participants, 89% had experienced phantom vibration syndrome. What is that? It means that natural occurring vibrations in their body, like a little leg twitch or whatever, well, maybe not that subtle, but um, they think is their phone going off. And they grab their phone repeatedly. 40% of them experience that every single day. This is scary. Multitasking is making it so that we're all more distracted. We're less able to finish and complete a task. A 2009 Stanford University study shows that people can no longer complete tasks as efficiently as they used to because they can't stay with something start to finish. We're too distracted from switching between topics all the time. Our brains are changing, and they are making piles of money. This is the sad part of the talk. We'll bring it back up in a minute. OK, so these products don't work for you. You work for them. And I want you to think about that. When you're working for a product, when you're designing something for your customers, are you doing it in service of them, or are you asking them to work for you? It's totally Pavlovian. I got to treat one time, I keep responding forever. You just have to give me a few treats. I know it's happening. It's humiliating. The attention economy is short-sighted. Just like every other major transition, we're starting to see this transition. So in a 2014 social media study, I can't remember what it was called. I'll have to look that up. Um, it was. It was noted that 10% of Twitter users left, and 9% of Facebook users left. And the reason that they left was privacy, being sick of being advertised at all the time, and realizing that they needed more time with their friends and family, face-to-face -face interaction. I want to challenge you guys to say no to designing for codependency and to break this cycle. Get rid of this guy. If not, for maybe we can keep the dolphins. <laughs> so five simple principles, and I've got nine minutes, so I'm going to cruise through these. We can do better. Five principles for ke keeping your product from becoming in a, did I write, yeah, I did, attention-sucking demon. OK, amplify the person, not the product, is the first. So let's think about that. What did Lee wish for? This is where you guys will yell out the answer. What did she wish for? Calm, pause. I'm hearing a couple of different words, but we're on the right track. And what, what in her day-to-day -day life was getting in her way? What was getting in her way? Meetings, people, all this other stuff that was demanding something from her. OK. I'm not sure what he's saying. Oh, that was serious talking to me now. Um, so I want to just stay with Lee for a second. And I'm like learning how to control this thing. OK, so staying with Lee for a second. So when I interviewed her a second time and I said, hey, Lee, what could they have they have done differently? And she's like, you know, don't bug me, but man, it would have been awesome if they just blocked out a little, had, like, had me agree to, first time I said, just block out a little chunk of my calendar every day. Like, show me a, a place that I can, like a time that I can set aside for this. But don't be periodically bugging me throughout the day, because now you're behaving like every other distraction. And I was like, that's interesting. But this company wasn't listening to her goals or trying to understand what it was that she needed. So let's look at the next. Get acquainted with reality. What's her typical day like? So 
a thing that I love to do is I love to, when I'm designing something, I like thinking about what else is going on? Who are they talking to? What is their mindset when they walk into the situation? Where were they right before this? What do they do on a typical day? If you don't have the money to do a lot of research on your projects, one of the things that you can do is you can carry a little journal with you and develop an observational practice every day in your life. This doesn't have to be a special thing that you set aside that you do only when you get budget on a project. This is something that you can do as a practice and it's really good for you for a bunch of other reasons. It's kind of meditative. But so I carry a little journal with me and when I'm on the bus, I'm making notes about what people are doing and you know what I'm observing. When I'm in meetings with people at work, it's great too because you can also help other people understand how to better communicate with some of your team members based on the fact that you may have known them for four years. You have an entire journal about it. So once you understand what it is you're trying to do, you should write a job description for your product. A lot of startups that I work with have no idea what their product's job is. Because this forces you to get really, really precise. So a, an anatomy of a job description is you have a job title, it's simple, it's easy to remember, there's a description, you have a list of responsibilities. What is this thing supposed to do? How do we know if it did it? A supervisor. That is an awesome thing to talk about. Who's actually responsible for maintaining the information in this? Because some of that is going to be outsourced to the customer or to the end user. Skills, qualifications, working hours. No, I don't want by default my refrigerator to be sending me notifications at midnight. I'd like to just never have to opt out of that. Like, let's just be realistic. Working hours with my refrigerator? I don't know. When I'm awake? Okay. So define its character. What if it were human? So once you understand what its job is, how is that job manifested? So I like these guys, the muse, the friend, the concierge, the happy distraction, the coach, the utility guy. Wyatt was looking for this, the happy distraction, but his game, it behaved more like this in a way. It was like, you haven't planted wheat. You gotta do that right now, or your fields will, you know, wilt away or whatever. So if you think about a product that allows you to, I don't know, make dinner reservations, which of these, which of these manifestations of a personality do you believe maybe makes sense? Like, let's look at the concierge. How does this help you? If you pick the concierge, when I talk to a concierge about which restaurant I go to, they know the local area, and they tell me a good one. And you know what? They don't go with me. <laughs> they never come with me. That's the rule, right? Wouldn't that be so weird? You're at the hotel, and the concierge is like, yeah, let's go to dinner. <laughs> so this is how I use these, personif these, these personalities, and it helps me to think about what are the rules of engagement with this particular personality and the role that this product has in the customer's life? Finally, respect their time. This is the fun part. We're gonna end the talk just together, just being crazy. Okay, so respect their time and have a damn good reason for interrupting people. So, we're gonna practice. Do you think that this is all really stuff I need to know about? This is, why is this showing up by default? I hate the fact that I have to turn all these notifications off. All right. So, half tank of gas left. Should we interrupt? Are you sure? tricked you. Uh, you have spinach in your teeth. Should I interrupt? You have spinach in your teeth. I don't know. Yeah, I kind of think so. I kind
kind of thinks that the guy in the back is like, do it, spinach. <laughs> Your butt does look big in that outfit. Should I, <laughs> should I interrupt? I don't know. I don't know about that one. I kind of feel like, yeah, maybe, but like maybe like do it quietly over here. That person comes out in a whole brand new outfit after that. Watch out for the bus. <laughs> Should I interrupt? Should I text them? <laughs> this one, this is what's going on. <laughs> Should I interrupt? This is really interesting because I have found this disconnect in a lot of products that they're interrupting you for sort of the baseline status of things. That's a new thing. That doesn't make sense. So you have a dashboard, you have something, you, it, that's a, that has a passive, passive posture. It means like you go to it when you need something, but it doesn't need to come to you. So in conclusion, these are the five things that we're going to do from moving from a my product is the center of the universe and narcissistic posture to being one that is more sensitive, thoughtful, and not totally ridiculous. Thank you. <laughs>